Yeah. So that that was a that was a a really good phone call. That was like my best phone call of the year. Is all I'm gonna say. So, uh, yeah, they. Uh, I don't know where we were going at before that, man. I so I don't know if people were like we. Me and you were trying to get on. I really, really, really wanted you on after Toledo. I don't know if you're frozen or it's me, but either way, I'll keep going. Uh, guys, I really wanted Matt. It, and what's funny is me and Matt have been talking for like 10 minutes and everything was fine. And now we start the live and it goes instantly to him frozen. And I, and I, and I will say it could be me. I don't know. It is blowing about 30 miles an hour outside from the North wind. So, um, I'll just keep going. Uh, I'll also say this. So I wanted him on duck. It's jamming his feet. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's already nervous, man. Okay. So it, I guess it's not me. It might be him. He just, he just got out. So he'll be back. Uh, yeah. We were talking for like 10 minutes before all this. Cause I hadn't got a chance to talk to him for a while. And so, uh, everything was fine. I'll say this. Um, I really, really wanted him on after Toledo and I wanted to see like what his thoughts were after the very first one. And I'm sure a lot of y'all, Okay, that's the one, one minute in. in I know that's why I was telling everyone, I was like, we've been talking for like 10 minutes, and and my service might be going crazy because like we got this crazy northern front kind of going on. It's but, probably uh, it's probably mine. We have like <clears throat> sustained 40 mile an hour. Well, not sustained, but we got really bad winds right now, too. Yeah, I was telling everyone we have about 30 mile an hour winds, so uh yeah. So yeah, those um I really wanted you on and then we couldn't make it happen me and you because it was just it's it's really we've been great all fall because we don't really have these like tournaments going on and so like us I don't think people realize like the mixing and matching of like tournament days and practice days and all this stuff it's just it's going to be hard to do these but I'm glad we got today because I leave tomorrow to go practice and nothing i'm going on next week for another term i was gone like 10 days i was 10 days in of a practice day tournament day practice 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 tournament day tournament day practice tournament day tournament day so <laughs> well are you three, how, how did you do in them are you rolling them oh no did, did horrible well the last one we we crushed on them on the last day and 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 made it all back i um the toyota was so I will say this. So every tournament this year has been a trailer event. Every okay. tournament so far has been 15 to 20 mile an hour wins. We have tried to practice for those, but I'll be honest, we've been kind of fishing differently. And, and we've been like to really catch a giant bag, like a 30 something pound bag. There's areas of the lake that we need to do that in. And we've been really trying, we've been practicing those. And I've been catching a lot of big ones. I've kind of shown a little bit of that in social media. I haven't shown all of them, but I've, um, and we have yet to got, get to fish one of these places or these areas. And so um, it's not a spot. We've got multiple, but it like, it, it's just been really, it's been really strange. I got another funny story too. And then um, the Toyota was just bad, man. It, it like, I don't know what to say about it. I mean, I, I kind of thought I, I knew I wasn't on them on them. I knew I wasn't like on them. Great. Um, yeah. I caught a big one every single day, but my, my, like, it was weird. I was like, okay, I can catch two and a half to two, like two and three quarters would be, a would be like upper echelon of fish for me. Yeah. And then I would catch a giant. So every day I caught a big one and I'm like, well, if I can do catch one of these a day, but one of these days I might catch two. And then I never caught any. And then day one, I caught all three all three pounders. And I was going, that was the one fish I couldn't catch was a three pounder. And so I caught five of them, which was weird. And I never caught a big one. <laughs> never even think I lost one or anything. And it was just, it, oh, it was my first time to miss a check in a Toyota. And I don't, I would like to say six to seven years. 
So I wouldn't wow. happy about that streak ending. I missed it by like two places or something, but it still made me mad. Then we we kind of called him at Conroe on day two and went from like 30th back up in the top 10. So it was okay. Yeah, turn, tournament season full swing right now, dude. Like, full I mean, I, I feel like, like until May, I'm home. I'll be home for a little like nine to like a, like a week and a half. And then it's like gone for a week and a half, home for a week and a half, gone for a week and a half. And and then you throw in like the Bassmaster Classic, and that's another thing that – are you going to that? Do you go to that, the Classic? We're not going to talk about that. We're not going to – we're not going to – we're not going to bring that up. You freeze on me, Todd? No, yeah, we're not going to bring that up. So we – we We're not? No, 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 no. Like, so I have a tournament that weekend, and no one's asked me to go. <laughs> Okay, no one's no one's asked me to go, so I'm just creeping along, trying. And and to be honest with you, it's the one time I want to go. Like, yeah, that's the one place I like. I love Grand Lake. I love it up there, but I already kind of like we we've got this tournament series. That's the one we won a boat in last year, and we're we're not doing good now. But it doesn't matter. Like you know, so far no one's asked me to go, and so yeah, but. It's a busy, busy time of year, though. That's for sure. <clears throat> See, like this right here, Mother of Nature is revolting against Ford facing sonar. <laughs> not, not for the pros, dude. The pro, like, listen, y'all at Toledo Bend, insane weather for y'all. The elites, insane weather. The Invitational on Rayburn, it was cloudy and dead calm for three days straight, mm-hmm. and then. Um, where the where the uh I don't know how how was Santee? Uh weather wise it was I mean it was cold, but like conditions wise it was decent. Was it the, cold? So I guess it would be the, the third and fourth day of the tournament they allowed us the trailer, but it, it really was not like it wasn't terrible. The problem is it's similar to Toledo in that there's it's just stump filled, but there's no boat lanes there. So right. like you need you don't even know where you're going. So they they allowed us the trailer, but I mean it wasn't like terrible conditions. It was breezy, but it wasn't terrible. Yeah, we we've had like we've trailered every now we didn't trailer in the in the Toyota. Like day one was awesome, and day two it blew like twenty something out of the south. It was it was you can yeah. run the lake, but it 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 kind of. Um, that wasn't that bad, but all the other ones were trailer events. Like they, like they would not have let us go in a regular tournament because we couldn't have gotten out of the um, the weigh-in place. I mean, you could have, but it would have been it'd have been a nightmare. Is all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I mean, I think trailering is becoming a little bit more common these days. Not even weather-wise. I think the organizations don't necessarily like to take a lot of that risk on, which. You know, I, I, I'm i okay with, but it does change the game up a little bit. That's you, for you sure. Won't, you won't hear me complain about it at all. Yeah. But because our lakes, though, the trailering – like right now, I mean, it's blowing – dude, there's six-footers on Rayburn. I mean, it, yeah. my, my deal is this, is that, like, I, I've I've done all that. I've done I've done enough big waves in my lifetime that I'm not macho. I mean, I can drive the heck out of them, dude. I'm not scared to do it. What I don't like is that fact it ages your boat more than anything else. Mm-hmm. It, it's yeah. the quickest thing to age your boat is is rough. Dude, water. it's the body. It's the body too. Like I got to tell you, the last couple of years, I've had a lot of lower back issues, and I attribute it to boat rides. Like I feel like that's where it's coming from, but. Dude, I'll I'll be like going along, and in that rough water, like I'll hit a wave right, and it'll be like my legs will go numb. Like I'll have yeah. like tingling that go down my legs. So, believe me, when they when they said at Sandy Cooper, like you know we're gonna trailer, even though it wasn't supposed to even start blowing till the afternoon, I took full advantage of it. Like, there's no reason to beat your boat up, beat yourself up if you can do it. Um, but it, I do agree with you 100%, man. The boat, it's really more of an issue for the boats. Like, you just beat the crap out of them to the point where it's just going to lead to issues down the road. Yeah, and and these aren't like, 
we don't have service trailers at these events. I mean, there's guys out there in six, seven, eight year old boats and they're like, it, it just like, I was in that position too. I mean, it just was horrible. And it, it just, you just, you get done with the tournament and you're like, okay, what do I got to go fix? What do I got to, you know, what, what brackets fell off or what, you know, because it just, and so I, I will never yeah. complain yeah. about trailering. I, I was just complaining about the fact that we, we were getting unlucky with the way, like, it was like every single time it was like this North wind coming through and it wasn't like the bite was bad. It just it limited on where you can fish, but I mean, it's just one of those deals, you know? Yeah. So, uh, it's supposed to be nice this well, it's supposed to be calm this weekend. So I can't wait, I guess I'll probably do bad. Anyways. Where are you fishing this weekend? Rayburn. Where are you, where are you fishing? Rayburn. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we got Ray. We got back to back Rayburn events or something because we got the um, we got I got we I got to start looking at some of this, but we yeah we have like a Brandon Belt. It's a hundred. So we just got done with the Brandon Belt on Conroe, and you know freaking what did we it was cool too because we we finished eighth. We finished tied for eighth. We won almost fourth. It, I, I, they split it up so nineteen hundred and fifty. So like, you know, 30, well, it was 19, what was it exactly? It was like $3,800, $3, but then we won another $800 in side pop money for day two money because we had a big bag on day two. So we ended up making about $4,600, $4,700, and it was a free entry fee. I mean, not too, not too shabby, but this first place, this um, first place is going to be, be uh, well, bash before that, which is like 44,000 or something for first. And we're gonna have a camera guy in our boat, too. I, I found this out, and then uh, <laughs> and, which I, they asked me, I'm like, Yeah, I don't care. Camera's running in my boat all the time. And then the next week is that Brandon Belt for like, I think it, I think they say it's 150,000, it's 60,000 cash mm -hmm. and a 90,000 dollar bass boat, like a That's legit crazy. bass pack, like a loaded out, not just a little prize package boat, like. The boat you would want if you were going to. I mean that it. that pays better than the bass opens. Yeah, that's why it's why everyone's asking me why I'm not fishing the opens. I'm like, because I pay better this. than the bass opens. Yeah, and they're free for us, and they're a thousand dollars. Yeah. Well, twelve hundred for the side pot. Yeah. So, yeah, I was I was looking at all this. So that what did they say? Uh, and, and then we'll get back into what you were talking about. So I don't know if this was true. Did you see like Chris Zaldane's freaking boat where he had like four? Was that was that like a, a gimmick or was he being, was that serious? No, he, uh, yeah, he I serious. watched it. He, he basically just went around to a bunch of elite series guys and, you know, showed off their boats. And, you know, I think, I think for, Somebody like well, myself watching it, that's just kind of like the norm at the top level, you know, to have everybody have, I don't know, four to seven graphs and transducers no, and all that. But there's a picture of him with like, I, I do think it was probably an eye opening experience for a lot of. Yeah, that was that was Brian Schmidt's boat he was sitting in that had four. Was it four across the back? Did I lose you again? I don't know. I can hear oh. you. What, it was, was four. It? Yeah, Brian, he was he was sitting in Brian Schmidt's boat. He had four graphs, and then he had another three, I think, on the front. So he had seven graphs total. He was just going from pro to pro's boat, oh. showing what everyone had. And I mean, guys had. I mean, at twenty, I don't think anybody had twenty thousand dollars. Like they said, twenty thousand dollars a couple of times, but most of those guys are running thirty plus thousand dollars worth of stuff. Just disgusting. I mean, I, really, when you think about it, it's disgusting. That that's I don't know. I mean, I'm not even gonna get, in, get into that. There uh, how many eight, do you run? Four. How many graphs? Yeah, that's what I got. Two and two. I've been running four for like I I mean, listen, I get that that's still a lot, but it doesn't feel like I would say that four is pretty much the if anything, it's on the 
I, I see a lot more guys with five, three on the front and two on the back. Yeah. So of, of watching that, the one thing that stood out the most that they didn't really touch on was Scott Martin's boat. Scott had uh, two forward-facing sonar transducers in forward mode facing opposite each other. So my they didn't talk about it, but my assumption is he's got one forward and one exactly behind that. So when he rotates the trolling motor, he's got one to the left side of the screen, one to the right. So when he rotates it, he's actually getting both sides of the trolling motor, well, which I was like, no, you don't think so? Well, no. What's he doing with it? You well, know, one he's, one, he's using perspective mode with one of them. No, he's got both in forward facing. That's what I'm saying. And yeah. then he, I think he, no, well, no, no. The like, so like, I can move my, I can have two forward facing as well on mine. Like, I just got one put in a perspective mode, so I can, I go perspective and. and but you have them both facing forward. Yeah, but I can change it real quick. And if I wanted to use it, I I think I. No, when I say forward, I mean you I, have it shooting. I know. Oh, okay. I know. I know. I know why he's doing it, though. But you don't want to share it with us. I'll share it with you later. Well, it's not my place to say. <laughs> well, right. like, hey, look, man. I, like, I will say this, man. If if you told me something in private, I probably wouldn't say it. I would never say it in public. So, like. I don't know if it was in private what he said. He just thought he had an he has an idea. I'll put it to you that way. It's an idea of what he thinks. Now I can promise you he he probably hasn't done it yet. But huh. or he it ha, it's not like this is he's been doing this for he he thinks he might be able to figure something out. Nothing crazy. Yeah. One of those deals where like but like you know how many guys half those guys have a for, they put forward facing sonar on the back of their boat. Yeah. That to me, I have enough trouble trying to pay attention with the one graph or two, anyways. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I, I have uh I mean I think I think there might be some lakes like St. Clair where that could really come into play, or even to even honestly Toledo Bend, I think that that could have been helpful to break down water really fast, but it'd be hard, it'd be hard to keep an eye on. All those blips well, as you're going forward. Well, so this is the only thing I'll say is because like some guys have said, some guys have, some elite guys have like said, hey man, he, try doing this, Todd. And I'm like, nope, it won't work. And they're like, and they kind of argued with me. And I'm like, dude, it's not going to work. I, I like, I get what you're saying, but like, we don't, you can't go do that up here. And um, I think if I had that conversation with them after Toledo, they'd agree with me. Because a lot of them are like, God dang, these catfish here and these this and that. I'm like, yeah, that's what I mean. If if you go up to the Great Lakes and put that thing down, we, we got some lakes too that if you just fish them, everything you see is a bass. Like, like if you just scroll around, it don't matter mm -hmm. where you're at on the lake. Like if you see one 99% of the time, it's a bass. Well, in Toledo, yeah, that's not the case, right? Like you see a lot of catfish. And the catfish yeah. aren't even bad yeah. right now, but there's going to be, I'd say six months out of the year, you see just as many catfish as you do bass. And you have to look at a catfish or some of those things for a while. Like you, like if you're driving, going real fast or doing whatever, and you just went by it, you'd have to like, look at it for a second and be like, man, is that a bass or is that a catfish? And so, um, and even then, even then, you don't know. And I and, and I have said this before with people. I was like, man, I've made a video about this. I'm like, guys, I know you think these elite guys are really, really good. And you want to believe everything they say. Elite guys, BPT guys, whatever. I said, don't get, don't listen to them. If you hear a guy start telling you how good he is on live scope and how he can tell a half pound here and what the... All these things. Like, I, I've heard this from, I'm not even talking about elite guys or BP. I've heard this from normal, random guys that I know of, like, might get a check in a tournament, like, once every three months. And they go to talking to me about how how they're great with live scope. And then I see guys that are, like, top of the game, 
like phenomenal guys. And you'll see him going, ooh, I hope this is a bass. And they, they say it all day. And, and I'm the same way. They're like, man, I don't know what this – like Drew Gill said it. Uh, I can just go on and on about guys that like say that during the tournament, during on live going, oh, man, I hope that's a bass. Or I threw at it not thinking it was a bass and it turned out to be one. Or how many guys do you look out there and go, they have 19 pounds and they're catching 14 inches? On live scope, I'm like, why are you catching a 14 incher? If you now, I'm not saying all those guys said that. I want to be clear about. I'm not saying Drew Gill or any of those guys. Have, I'm saying I've heard other guys say that, and I'm like, you're looking at some of the best guys in the country, and you can tell they don't know. Like they're catching fish that doesn't help them. Like if if it didn't help them, why do they make a cast at it? Because they're wrong. I'm just letting everyone know, man. Like don't get so frustrated and think that these guys are that much better or not that much better but like think that they like there's a lot of guys out there telling everyone they they can see a two and a half pounder from 100 feet away and be like yep that's what that is you know because they they're catching catfish like crazy out there and white bass and crappie and all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff yeah especially on uh, toledo is loaded with there yeah. were a lot of drum giant crappie like you i mean most the guys that I like, you know, I'm rooming with, you know, Matt Becker and Drew Gill and Spencer Shuffield, who are all like scoping geniuses. This, you know, they're way better than I am at it. And they pretty much are like, if it's there, I'm throwing at it. Like, yeah. like there's only one way to make sure that you know what you're looking at. And they would rather catch the fish and have it be not a bass or catch the fish and have it be a short and know that they caught it. Cause the, the reality is with those transducers, depending on how the fish is facing the transducer, it could show up as a small fish. It could show up as a big fish. You know, it all comes back to how well that returns come in. And you, you've been talking to you, the best, the best guys out there, the best guys out there cast at everything. Yeah. You've been talking to drew. I can tell. Dude, Drew is Drew is he is wild to talk to. Like, I know. I mean, for a 21 year old kid, he has got like I, I we'll engage in conversations, and I'll be like, I've never looked at it that way. Like, and it's, I, I it, it's not even necessarily like all based on forward facing sonar. It's more of his interpretation of what he's learned based off of what he's seen on forward facing sonar that makes him think a lot of what we've always felt was kind of like, you know, the, by the book in bass fishing is wrong. And I can't necessarily say he's right or wrong, but to have a different perception is crazy. And to get it in the, and he communicates it so well, that's the thing for a 21 yeah. year old kid, he talks like he's got 50 years of experience. And it's just a really I, – I love it because I'm I'm trying to soak it all in, dude. I, I like, do want to have a – I want to have a conversation with him, though. Like, I know you him. Should. Well, I want to have – well, I, I'll put it to you this way. I think he needs to <laughs> – Probably, I should probably do this not here. But I think he needs to tone it back. So, don't you think, though, that uh, – like – and this isn't just like younger generation, but younger people. A hundred percent. Not just not not just fishing. I'm saying in anything. There's always that sense of confidence, and that's what I get from him. Like it was funny because I relayed him back to a uh, uh, one of my traveling partners. I had a co angler who was a young graduate, just graduated college. I had him for several years, and there there's that sense of I know everything. I've watched every video. Yeah, I've watched and read everything. When and I it's say like, wow. it back. That's not a negative thing. No, not it's, at all. It, it, what I mean by, if I was his friend, if I was his really, and I've done this with some people, I'm like, hey man, probably do one less uh, podcast. Probably maybe not put that on YouTube. Probably not do, probably keep that to yourself for a little bit. And the reason I've said that is this, is that like every really, really good fisherman I've ever met that sustained sustained stuff for a long time keeps keeps things close for as long as possible 
because it's going to get out because he's on camera. But man, the way he got to learn, like the way the younger generation is now, like you've seen every video and all that stuff. Well, guess what? Someone two years younger than him is doing the same thing too, right? And so I it those when you get a secret, and I've had them before, I've had a lot of them before, and I kept them as long as I possibly could and made a ton of money off of them. A ton. And I'm just like, I I just, I would, that's what the only thing I would tell him because he is, I know how he is and he is on it. Like he is, he gets it and he's excited yeah. and he's catching Dude, I, I, I disagree. I disagree with you. Okay. I think, I think he's doing absolutely what he should be doing. No, see, this is what should happen. You should get frozen. See, even, even internet, even the internet agrees with me. Am I there, Todd? I don't know because I was telling everyone the internet agrees agrees with me because it cuts you out. (laughs) (laughs) All I'm saying is, dude, Drew, in my opinion, Drew's going to be around a long, long time in this game, and the best anglers out there. They share their secrets, and they're still killing it, dude. He's He's got everything. Yeah. Like, I guess what I was saying before is, like, his mindset is different. He pieces it together in a different manner where even if he shares the goods with you, he almost shares it in a different communicative style where most people will be like, Never would have thought of it that way. Had I just gotten the little tidbit, I won't even they you won't even line it up the way that he's doing it. And that's the thing. Like the best anglers out there, dude, they're gonna they're gonna make it happen regardless of whether somebody knows their secret, which in reality, everybody knows the secret, dude. I, I don't everybody. Agree with that. I don't agree with that. Oh, okay. okay. Let, me, let me let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Uh So, so everyone thinks this hybrid hunter is like the only secret I ever had, right? Was uh, when when it made sense to you, right? Uh, do you know how many guys that I have put that bait in their hands for five years, and 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 nothing, like it, like nothing, like never threw it, and then all of a sudden, they'll come to me and they'll go, oh this is it and like and it's like it was like a light bulb in their head went off and it was like straight it went from nothing to like they threw it everywhere they went and smashed on them and what i would say is is that like there are things i think sight fishing is like one of those things for me too that i look at me and my buddy russell we look at sight fishing probably different than 99 point than probably everyone we know And that stuff is important. And when you watch people, and we say that all the time, is that when we watch people do it, and whatever they think we're watching them do, not even flipping at, just everything they do with, like, from the start of the day to the end of the day, everything we see, we're like, missed it, missed it. Like, okay, hey, hey, don't worry. They're just doing this. We're good. Or, hey, oh, that's why they're not getting it. I'm sorry, man. There's for like 99, 90% of most elites aren't that great at sight fishing. They're not. Just because they can catch some fish off of beds, that's not a big deal. But there's a reason why a couple of them beat everyone else by a lot. It's not even close. Those are secrets. And I'm telling you right now, I know those guys. They ain't saying nothing to nobody about some of that stuff. I mean, there are so many things that go on in this industry that like, man, you know that there are, there are, there are stuff out there that like no one talks about and they're, and they are big. You might not think they're big deals, but they are the difference between fifth place and first place. And that difference is freaking 20, 30, 40, $50,000 at times. Hold on. Hey, You're muted. 
How does how does that happen? I don't know. I didn't do it. <laughs> so I am I am not saying that there aren't secrets and you can't have advantages. And I would argue that the advantage, like you're like little. I mean, I'm a I consider myself a sight fisherman as well, and there are definitely little things that are better to keep to yourself as a sight fisherman than a forward facing sonar fisherman that's out in the middle of the lake. Like I think there's there's a it's way easier to show somebody or to tell somebody that little trick on a bed fish than just to say, Hey, you want to go do this and make the, the forward facing sonar work. But what I will say is I honestly do feel like those secrets, I think can be very valuable to an individual, but the majority of people will never take that secret and implement it into their own fishing. So from that standpoint, it's not that Man. relevant and the best, the best guys at certain techniques, even with others knowing those secrets are still going to pound on them. You no, know, I, all I'm saying is I've seen a couple of guys and like, man, um, the, some of the comments that drew made when, uh, I've heard, I've heard two or three people in the past three days. Okay. Two people, they made comments to me like, shouldn't, have, they didn't know. And I but wouldn't shouldn't, want to have, know. shouldn't have spilled the beans. Hundred percent. Yeah. Like, like he, like, and and they're thankful for it. Don't get me wrong. And 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 they ain't telling nobody else that like 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 I heard them say something, and it's like, hey man. And I was going, mm, yeah, I probably I, I shouldn't. Don't give me that piece of information because little bits and pieces of information. I just I will say I think the best fishermen. And that's what that's what I was be worried about. Not ninety percent of them, yeah. but you take those really good fishermen and you give them one little bit of us. When Drew, when David Mullins went fishing with me, like two years ago, and we've been fishing before, whatever. He got one bite with me one day, one bite, and he looked at me, and I was like, <laughs> smiled at him. He goes, "Huh." And dude, all I'm gonna say is yeah. it it unlocked a different, whole different David Mullins. Like of this one whole aspect of it. And he has never shared it. You wouldn't even know. No one even knows. But like it, it was one bite, and he looked at me. I'm like, that's what it's like. That's what it's supposed to be. And so I mean, it it um those guys, it doesn't take those guys because then he started like figuring out, he would call me back and go, Hey man, this, 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 and this. And I'm like, yep. He said, well, that's everything. I go, I know, you know? And so those are the guys that they only need a little and they'll freaking take it a lot. Yeah. No, I, I don't, I will agree hundred percent with that, that the guys at the top level, they don't need much. You, you give one mm -hmm. little tidbit and it's, they're on top of it from that standpoint. But yeah, I'm saying if, if Drew were to, unveil uh you know say something that the majority of anglers are not going to pick up on what he's saying but the top guys for sure will i don't know what you're referring to with the no information rule i don't know what that means either i don't know if you said the fact that i went out with david mullins like went out to lake mac because we're freaking buddies and we went fishing in between his events of wherever he was going i don't know i don't know what that meant i no like it there's a big difference between, and I don't know anything about fork, but there's a big difference between me talking about fork and then me, uh, uh, an elite guy coming with me and going to Lake Mac for a couple of day for a day. Not that that happened. I'm just saying like, Hey, we got a couple of days off for a fork. You want to go fishing? I'm like, yeah, like we're, yeah. we're buddies. Like I was supposed to go shoot, go shoot a uh, show with Scott Martin and uh, Andrew Upshaw ended up going and doing it. Like, yeah, we talked well, we about we like, even tried to make it happen a little bit. Yeah. When I, I came mean, down for Toledo. Yeah, exactly. Like that's not, that's not in for, we can, sh you, I don't know if they understand the information rule is information about a lake, not information about fishing. Yeah. Like if yeah. I had a technique that I wanted to tell you about, I can tell you about it the day before Lake Fork, but we're not talking about Lake Fork. We're yeah. just talking about like, we can call up about techniques and all kinds of stuff. All right, whatever. I don't even care about any of that. I want to know. So how how was how was your two?
tournaments. Do you want? Do you even <laughs> care about talking about Toledo, or which one do you want to talk about? I don't. I don't. I mean, uh, you know, my am I satisfied with the two tournaments? I mean, I feel like I escaped both of them. You know, yeah. to, in a in a quick nutshell, I mean, Toledo Bend, I. I tried to approach Toledo as Rayburn and I spent my first day of practice, like looking in ditches, 20 foot of water or less looking for ditches. Didn't find Jack crap. Then the second day I went and I beat the bank and had a few bites, but like, I mean, I think I had five bites all day long and two of them were keepers. And then day three, I was like, I, I, I got to figure something out and I got out in the standing timber and figured out the Demiki stuff, like out over 50 foot of water base, 40 to 50 foot. And, you know, in a half day of practice found enough stuff to get me through, uh, to get a paycheck and, you know, okay points. But, you know, in hindsight, it was like, gosh, dang, if I had just gone a little deeper out the first day, I probably would have figured that deal out. Uh, and then, day uh on sandy cooper i mean i far excuse my language i uh i i zeroed i zeroed day one and and then had a really good day two and cashed the check and got out of there with okay points and both events i had you know basically eight pounders so i'm sitting really good for heavy hitters and like you know i i, I survived i'm not super excited about either one because in either case had i you know i feel like i i feel honestly i feel like it's sandy cooper i had the winning area after day two i really feel like those fish were flocking to me by the hour i mean i was fishing i was basically fishing one big bay and i would it'd take me an hour to make a pass through all the cypress trees and by the time i'd make the second i'd go first pass i'd I'd catch one second pass. I'd catch two third pass. I'd catch three. Like it was getting better. And based on looking at weights, I mean, I feel like I could have been very, very, uh, I could have done all right in that tournament had I actually got through and zero in day one. I mean, it felt like a dream, dude. It was like, that doesn't happen. Like that doesn't happen. So, you know, I, I feel okay about the finishes. I'm, uh, I feel okay about everything. I mean, it's, it's, you know, interesting from a, a bass pro tour standpoint, you know, the, the anglers have been extremely welcoming, you know, which I kind of expected, kind of didn't expect, but everyone has been really, uh, really great. You know, I think there's, there is a it's little not, bit of, it's not what? the same 80 guys. No. Well, hmm. and, and, and some of those guys that left, I might be better friends with a lot of the guys that left, but I always felt too, when that first started, that was first 80 was like, they were, they were very, it was them against the world. Yeah. And, and it shouldn't have been like, they kind of went a little too hard against everyone. Like it was them against. So like, I, I think, I think some of the guys that got voted in at the last, like the couple three or four were not really even wanted. Um, yeah. just because like that, and now it's, it's so many of them have left and now, now they're looking at it in a totally different way to where it's, um, it's probably, it's probably way better than it is like, because it should have never have been this 80 against the world, but that's what it was when it started. And now it, luckily it's not like that anymore. Now it's more like, okay, this is where you need to be. If you want to qualify, here's how you get there. Now we let people who qualify in. And to me, now it's a way better system of how it should be. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's some recognition that they, some of the guys that were coming up, you know, myself or, you know, guys like Keith Carson or Ron Nelson, I mean, really established anglers. Uh, you know, I think there is the idea that, hey, maybe we actually can bring some value. Like maybe it's not a bad thing for us to be there, but it, you know, it, it was it was interesting because there was a lot of uh, a lot of very very positive comments like, "Hey, Matt, really happy you're here." You know, we hope you're excited to be here as well. And I was like, "Yeah, man, you know, it's great. 
I won't, this is the next level. And, and then it was kind of followed up with comments like, well, we'll see where we're at in a year. And it was kind of like, oh, well, little Debbie Downer to follow it up based on, you know, the, the discussions, which is understandable. I, I mean, I really kind of do have the sense that a lot of the anglers uh, are beaten down, feel beaten down at this point, which is 100% I think expected to be honest with you. I mean, that was kind of how I felt the last four years with, I mean, ever since the merger with FLW, it was kind of like take it or leave it. And if you're going to, if you're going to take it and fish, you have to recognize that you're not going to have a whole lot of say, you're not going to have a lot of pull. It is what it is. If you need a platform to fish, they'll provide it. But, you know, I think there was a, a, a lot of, promises made to those guys i mean i i don't i don't know right like i wasn't involved in that when the when the bpt was formed but it from the outside looking in i do think that those anglers were promised a lot of things and you know they never came to fruition which is burned out a lot of guys so it'll be interesting to me like you know to see how this all shakes out i'm i'm all in like at this point there's yeah. There's no better platform for me to be on right now. I know a lot of my my viewers are like, you got to go fish the elites. Well, it's not that easy, right? And you don't just sign up to fish the elites. You got to you got to fish your way in. And for me right now, I I mean, well, I'm enjoying yeah. the format. I'm enjoying the the situation and I I'm if I can if I can stick around for the next couple of years and get to a small 50 boat field, that could be a really good thing. Like assuming it gets there. I don't know if it will. And I will also mention, I'm still standing by the idea that this could potentially be the fastest way to get to the elites if there is a merger. So, you know, if you're in that 50 group field and bass cuts to a 50 boat field, like there's been some rumors at that point, maybe that is, you know, then you are in the super circuit. If you're, if you're, sticking it out that long so i you know i it's funny to me because a lot of people are so like a lot of the anglers are extremely negative towards it and i and i understand that from the yeah, standpoint they've been of there longer yeah there's they've been there longer and a lot of them i think probably recognize that they are on the chopping block right like they based on performance or where they're sitting like they may not requalify and i'm one of those anglers like as a rookie I have to fish my butt off to get into it. The The difference I feel like is they've been there and they're getting like kicked out right away. I kind of feel like I've got more of the opportunity to fish in and I, I guess I never saw what it was like in the past. So I'm, you know, I'm excited about the year. I'm still happy about the year and, and my decisions to stick around, but I do I'm think that there's... <laughs> You're going to say I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. No, I'm not. No, you no, have no I, idea. I, I, you, I, I, Matt, you are so far off about what I'm about to say. Okay. Okay. Let's hear it. Um, I'll start with this. You you said, hey, why don't you go fish the Opens? Um, I told my buddy, and he, he went against my better judgment, but not really. Because, like, it's not my judgment. It's just what I'm going to tell you. Just like Drew Gill. I would have a conversation with Drew Gill. You can agree or disagree. I bet you I'm not wrong. Okay? you. I, I'm not going to be wrong with what I say. You don't have to agree with the fact of maybe you don't care, but I'm telling you I will not be wrong in what I would tell him. And okay. that whatever I would tell him would benefit him more one way or the other. What, what I told my buddy, I was like, go fish the opens if you want to. I'm telling you, though, get ready for this. And I explained to him what was going to happen to him. And the, I said, man, you look at the you you look at everyone looks at all these things. You look at BPT, the elites, you you look at it from the outside in. You have no idea what it's like. So you had no idea what the BPT was like until yeah. you got there. And that's why I was more. I, I really wasn't worried about your how you finished in the BBT. It no offense, it really didn't sway me either way on you about your fishing ability or anything else like that. Right. I mean like big deal. I, I hoped you do good. And I and like it would be awesome for you like money wise and things like that. 
But I was more interested to see, like, I knew, like these things happen, and I'll get there. When my buddy went and fished the Opens, I said, hey, man, here's the deal. When I suck at an event, like I just did, you know, at Rayburn for the last two weeks, at two different events, not just one, but I get to go back-to-back, -back, you know, bad events. Dude, like, it, it's it's like you're just like down like and i had a fishing partner with me that's also down and we're like having to talk about it but at least you got some you know you're you're right there and like whatever you can bounce ideas off each other you can go work harder for the next time all that stuff and that's what we do i said man when you drive to okeechobee and you do bad and i said it will happen you will drive to an event i i'm at my home lake and and maybe i have to drive an hour home or whatever and you drive home and it's a 20 hour drive and you did one of the worst that horrible and you're like not only are you pissed about your fishing but then you're like gosh dang man i just i just paid two thousand dollars in entry fee to come to come do this bad i just can't i just paid two thousand dollars to to be to like not have fun like this was horrible <laughs> i spent six days away seven days away from home maybe more than that because of okeechobee and i'm like and i spent another two grand just to get down here i lost four grand i did horrible what am i and you got 20 don't don't worry you got 20 hours to drive home and think about that and he did i'm not gonna i don't mind mentioning his name because then he goes to washita right and makes the top five yeah okay so so he came back and then he did good at raven in the toyota so like he did one of his worst ever and then backed it up with two really good ones and i said hey and and okay and i said listen I'm not telling you not to go fish the opens but get ready for that drive and he and he called me up he said dude you hit it perfectly like you hit the nail on the head i said yeah i'm not telling you not to go fish the opens no, it is not Dakota Ebear. Anyways, I had nothing <laughs> wrong. And so in the uh and Dakota did not finish in the top five at Washita. So yeah, it it was like one of those deals where he was like, Man, you were right about that. Now it didn't mean he wasn't supposed to go fish the opens. I was just letting him know what was going on. I, I think some of these these elites and BPTs and they they Look, man, you think fishing the elite or the BPT and coming in like bottom 10 is fun? Like no one ever tells you like that's that's not a whole lot of fun. That's like depressing and, and horrible. And like you're still spending a bunch of money and all that stuff. So, I mean, it, it it's not just as easy as go fish somewhere else. So that's where I was kind of like, hey, man. And I think a lot of those guys on the BPT, um, I think they've been – if you if you're if you're doing good on those things you can get it's like you know how they always say what winning winning solves everything cures yeah. everything it does but man if you're kind of right there or even if you're kind of halfway doing good and that's kind of where i was at when i fished the tour i was like i'm making money like i'm making the force wood cup i'm doing like whatever but i was like man i, I but other things were bothering me and I was able to walk away and I still look, man, I still talk to those guys. I mean, they're not always, it's not always just peaches and cream out there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I, I will say like, I mean, I, I feel very, I kind of knew what I was getting into from uh, the standpoint of like fishing against the guys, like competition wise. Like I had, I had a lot of people that were reaching out beforehand like do you think you can compete you know or are you ready for the competition and i'm like i've been fishing against these guys for 15 years at this point like that's i want to let everyone know that is the that was not me am i right like i wouldn't even have that's not even a thought in my head about that stuff like yeah. that yeah so like it was more it for me i was more interested in like just how like how i would be received am i an outsider yeah coming in or is it yeah. like you're kind of one of the guys and it was very it was a very welcoming uh re like kind of reception which was really pretty cool but at the same time like i said there was a little bit of that 
feel of like, well, we'll see how long this lasts. Like, you know, we don't know what next year looks like. We don't know what the following year looks like. I mean, there were guys having conversations about what circuit they're going to fish next year. And I'm sitting there going, it's the first tournament of the year. And you're talking about what you're doing next year already. Like that yeah, was kind of odd. But you, knew, but, you, but you knew that. Like you knew. Yeah, that, but that, that's the thing. They, that's I would probably be doing the same thing had I right. been there for the past five or six years. You know, for me coming in, it was a, it was more of like, I'm still excited to be here because I'm out of the freaking invitational circuit series and you know i'm playing for better dollars and you know at this point it's been an okay start i mean you know you're never satisfied but it it could have been a lot worse at both of both yeah. events. Yeah. well like, i mean list <laughs> hey so i was really good on tour about doing this I, they made fun of me for a while because I had some of the worst day ones and like top two. Yeah, top dude, three you were bags great at like, yeah, like 20 plus pound bags on day two after catching like six pounds the first day. Yeah. And then I find out I get a freaking paycheck and I'm like, oh, that $10,000 went a long ways where I, where the day yeah. before I'm like, there's almost zero way I can even get a, like, I'm not even yeah. thinking about a check. I'm just like, how pissed off I am in the next thing. So it's a, Conroe, if you'd have seen, and we're on Russell's home lake. And granted, we had like 15 pounds, but we were like, I thought our first five fish would wait. We didn't have a, we didn't, we had one fish at 10 o'clock. And Russell's looking at me. I'm like, don't look at me, man. I was like, I've done good on Conroe, but it's been a couple of years since I've been here. Yeah. And I was like, man, like, but we ended up kind of pulling some things together. And then after day two, it's like, it erased all the last, 10 days, one day, one good day of like, Hey, we fished good this today. <laughs> we did really well. It's amazing yeah. what one day will like get you back on track. It's it's so, it's so funny. Cause the, you know, after, after zeroing the first day, you know, your mindset is different at that point. Like, it's like, yeah. I, I let me like, you know, at that point I'm sitting there going, well, if I don't catch a fish for heavy hitters, that's a thrown out the window. Like, cause all you, you know, they take the highest, biggest fish you catch at every event add them up and then your total is and your that's total a to place fall. to catch one God, exactly man. like you fall behind there that's like a toledo bend you catch a three pounder at toledo bend everyone else has sixes or bigger and right. so there were there you know the mindset changes to like let's salvage the tournament right like instead of being 40th in my bracket maybe i can be 32nd and catch a decent one for heavy hitters and try to salvage whatever you can. And, you know, but you get on the water. I mean, I was in, I, I caught one fish in the first period and I still was in last place at that point. So I moved from 40th to 18th in the last two periods. And it just like, but there's such a evolution of thought there where it's like, okay, well, I just moved to 37th place. And then it's like, well, now I'm in 33rd. Now I'm in 27th. And, you know, so when, when that day finished and they ended the day and it's like, holy cow, I salvaged the check and good points. I caught a seven and three quarter for big fish. It's like, it feels, it felt like I had won the tournament, I know, right? yeah. but the drive home was miserable because that's when I start thinking about how I zeroed day one yeah. and how I yeah. lost a couple fish on day, my day two, which it's like, I think I had a shot at making the top 10 cut even without with, with the fish I had on or missed on day two, like, but to think, you know, okay, if I'd caught 10 pounds on day one, I would have fished it. And those fish were flocking to the area. And it's like, I think I could have made a run at that one. And, you know, so it's, I think that's part of the game though. Had I, had I walked away being content with the finish, even after the first day, I, I don't think that's the necessarily the right mindset either. I, I mean, I think to be, at the top of the game, we should be evaluating our performance and disappointed with the things that went wrong. So hopefully correct that and move forward and have a better finish in the future. I, I've got, <laughs> I did a video on this the other day. It, it was more or less on this one. Um, it, it was more or less on this one. I'll leave it out there for a second. Hmm. And, and then there's this one. I, 
I should probably do a video. I, I don't know how to do a video on this, but like it would be hours long. But pre, there's some there's some thoughts I think about pre fishing that are um, one. I do not think it's a trap whatsoever. Uh, it's not even. Do you think it's important? I think it's freaking. Yeah, it's because like you give me more. Pre fishing to up to a certain point is important. But I can tell you how many times I've caught, uh, like how many times that in pre-fishing where it's like, there's a lot of different things that can happen, a lot. But one of is, is like, I can't tell you how many times we've caught 35 pounds because of pre-fishing because we went out there and found, and we're like, yep, when we show up there in the morning, it's on, it's over with. It, it, and, and those tournaments are great because you just show up there and it's it's over. It's like, you win the tournament in freaking 20 minutes. So yeah, yeah. it's important. And we would have never found those without it. Now. What's interesting, and I'll, and I'll talk about Conroe. Well, I'll talk. So my but I'll, I'll give you this one other thing about pre-fishing. A buddy of mine used to do really good, re, did really good at at um, going to a lake and catching them right off the bat, you know. And then the tournament, but he would he had time off. He'd have four or five days, and by tournament day, he wouldn't do that good. And he'd be so depressed. And I'm like, hey, man, stop practicing so much. And he's like, yeah, but I don't get to fish that much. Like, these are my days I'm taking off. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I get it. But it's not helping you. And he was like, man, I just like to practice. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, but, but you've been practicing your whole life. And it's yeah. and, and I have to go by these rules a lot. And he's like, what do you, I'm like, look, man, you show, you've been practicing for 25 years pre-fishing. Like, you've been pre-fishing for 25 years. Maybe not on this lake. But when you get there, you catch them because you show up to a lake, you look around, you start doing stuff, and nothing works until you figure it out. And you're like, this makes sense. And then you start catching them because you just got there that day. Now, it didn't always happen that way. But I was like, a lot of that's what's going on is you're just fishing the day and what looks right to you and what makes sense. As you move throughout the tournament, sometimes you're relying on on that first day but if you'd have just put you there on that day and you didn't catch anything for an hour doing that you would have instantly have stopped doing that and done something different if you if you didn't know that right and so i think that's the hardest part about pre-fishing is trying to figure out like not get caught up on the day or the three days before that and stuff like that but i mean um i definitely don't think it's a trap i think you can pre-fish too much but then I mean, I've said that too on day four of a of a practice day, and within the la I'll say at Alabama or when I was at Gunnersville, the f everything helped, but the last three hours of practice put me on me catching them. Yeah, dude, I think I think there's a big, uh, I think a lot of anglers would be surprised to see how the the like the best anglers in the world practice, like when when they when we get our official practice. It is, it's almost more of just a scouting trip and trying to figure out a ways to, to generate a couple of bites. And then you run with that in the tournament. Like if you're, you, well, I feel like a lot of, a lot of people burn themselves based on practice because they're, they're sticking all their fish or they're really trying to figure out like one little deal and that's it. Like if you can, if, if you can take one or two bites you get from practice and be able to, do that in other places of the lake like to me that's a lot more valuable so so you said something about scouting because there's a there i mean i could sit on i could sit on this topic forever you see i'm not a big i don't believe in like scouting a lake like like certain lakes like you can't scout um where y'all were just at sandy cooper you can't scout sandy cooper and you can't scout toledo bend you can't do it yeah. Why not? <clears throat> if you scouted Toledo Bend, I'll give you a week and you can't cover it all and you'll never make a case. Oh, just based on size. But, I, and I don't necessarily mean you guys see the whole lake. I, For me, I like to be able to say, I caught them here doing this. I know two other places that look okay. that set up similar. Okay, so I made a, that was my video. It, my video was about, about reading map, like, so I was never a big believer in getting my map out, never been to a lake before, and like and like studying a map. 
And the reason I didn't believe in that was because I was like, what am I studying? I don't have any answers. Like, I don't have a key. I don't have a key to this map. I don't know where I'm going to catch a fish. So I might study every drain on that entire map and then get there. And they're all on points. So what, what was I studying? Yeah. I totally believe, I always tell everyone, and you just said it. I want to find an area and get some bites. Then from there, I now know what to look for and I go. And so, yeah. you know, but I, what I'll say is, is because there's so many different avenues to go down this, this uh, topic. When you're fishing a two, three, four day event, that's how you got to do it. There is no spot. Yeah. Spots. There, there's no spot because you're not winning it on day one, especially in y'all's event. You know, it, at least in maybe an elite event where you accumulate the weight. Yes. There it's a little bit there, but you might have to burn it on day one. But for the most part, you're trying to figure out how to catch fish and like, and then like stay with them as everything yeah. goes on. Our events aren't like that. Sometimes we have one of, we have one day and they're so much harder to win sometimes because all this practicing with no, no, like, do you set the hook? Do you not set the hook? All this stuff. When we were on Conroe, Russell was like, Hey, I want you to go practice one day and pre-practice. But and, and I used to fish Conroe all the time. Like the first time we ever won a boat was on Conroe, but I, it's been years, you know, and, He's like, I want you to go in this area. You kind of know it. You know, I want your perspective. I want you to view it. And he never even went in there. He's like, you, you go do it. And I went in there and I got, I got bites and I put waypoints where I thought was good. And he, he knew, he knew kind of these, he knew it. Yeah. But it wasn't exact. He didn't know it. He knew it from the years past, but not like whatever. So I had like six waypoints there. Day one, we didn't start there. We went there and caught him on day one, a couple, and then left. But day two, we stayed there the whole time, caught a big bag. Where the guys won it was off one of my waypoints. Now, the guy who won it is a friend of ours, like, know him very well. He even said, he goes, yeah, man, I didn't get there till 1030. I didn't know it was that good. There were people who went past that area the whole time. He just happened to catch, like, two fives. They stuck around on it and ended up catching 22, went there the next day. And caught 26, never left. Wow. There's another guys that came in like top five that were a cast away from them. I had waypoints too, but I'm like, I don't know. Like when you get 20 bites in practice in an area, I have no idea which one's the best. Yeah. And it doesn't where where he caught those big ones. Um, I caught like a two and a half pounder. It wasn't even a big deal. I caught a five pounder, two cast away accidentally i didn't even have a hook on it it got it in its gill and it was jumping out there i'm like i have my button pushed i don't have a hook on what's going on and yeah. it and it went so i my point is is like you those tournaments like that you never really know what you're on even if you set the hook or didn't set the hook and it's sometimes you get lucky sometimes you don't but like you you have to kind of like it's way better to figure out figure it out because yeah. i guarantee you our day three would have even gotten better yeah. And that's what you want. You want your days getting better as the tournament goes along in a multi-day event. But the one day event thing, that's hard, man. It's a hard one to like figure. Yeah. There's a you can't mess up. You can't have a bad decision in there. You can't yeah, start they are they're totally different platforms, and practice needs to account for the type of tournament that it is. I mean, that's one thing with the BPT that I'm seeing is how critical it is. Like the ideal situation is to have a really good first day to the point where your weight yeah. is probably good enough to make the top 10. And then you go practice. Like you go practice knowing you're going to catch a few fish. But the idea is you're trying to find areas to push you through the next round. I mean, you don't you don't generally get to have that type of luxury in a five fish tournament. And you for sure don't in a one or two day tournament. But it's a... Uh, practice is critical i think for all of us to have a a good understanding as to what we want to do going in but it's also a reason why you you get a lot of uh you know if you talk to pros like before the tournament everyone's like are you on them and everyone talk like no not really but nobody really knows what they have like that's the oh, thing 
Yeah. Like half the time, everyone's like, well, I got a bite here. I got a bite there. And then you go there in the tournament and you catch five on five casts. Well, you'd never made more than one cast there in, in practice. So, you know, you never, you never really know wh what you've got, but I, I mean, I would think, I, I think practice is very important for a lot of people, including myself that don't have experience on those lakes. Like at the local level, I'll just show up and fish a lake that I've got tons of experience on. And I'd rather it be that way because then I, I can make the adjustments as needed. Yeah. And so I used, so I, I was the biggest believer in, um, and this is something random. I, I used to love watching, uh, guys like set the hook, but well, it pissed me off, but in practice when they'd catch them. And I was just going, uh, I was just like, man, what are they doing? Like, what does it matter? And then a lot of, and I get a lot of people asking like questions like, Hey man, how, how do you know if you're, how do you know if you're around big ones or not? And I'm like, man, it, we throw stuff that catches big ones. Like I'm not going around with like a shaky head or a Ned rig and getting a bunch of bites going, man, I don't know what I'm on. Like, you want to know, like, they're like, well, what do you throw out there? I'm like, throw something really, really big that only a big one's going to eat. And like, if you do that enough, those are big ones or you catch them on a top water. We just in general throw stuff that catches big ones. What I'll say though, is, is like, so I never, we never set the hook and, and I still don't think you should. However, however, I've come to this deal. I, I think I will argue with anyone that shaking them off is just as bad and and now i have a little listen to me i have a little proof to this you ready so this isn't just me randomly saying this if if you've if you've ever had one on a frog okay you frog fish right um we'll start off with this if you go into an area for the first time ever with the frog, the first time ever, and you shake every one of them off, and you you and you better answer this truthfully, that first time you go through an area is the best time is is always the best. Correct. Even if you shake every one of them off, okay, I agree. Flipping grass, doing stuff like that, same thing. Um. I, I had this fish in my tank, and this is the only reason I say this, that my bass in my tank, if it bit something more than once or twice and it couldn't eat it, it never tries to bite it again. It, and, and I would watch it, and if it did not like it, if it, if it, if it felt funny, so I remember like a green grasshopper, like first time I'd ever throw a green grasshopper, one of them like big gnarly ones, I threw that in the water. He gets it. He doesn't like it. Man, it bothered him. He spit it out. I threw it in there one other time. He hit it real quick, spit it out. And from then on, I could, he was always so hungry. He did anything in that tank. I'm about to put that in there. He do he he knew instantly. He's like, nope, don't like that thing. Don't want it. It didn't, it, I didn't get anything from it. And I started watching what does every fish do when it bites your bait? When you when you get one. 99% of them, if you get a bite, what does it do? It swims out to deep water, correct? They all swim away. They never just sit there. And I was like, man, if a fish, I'm just telling you that fish in that tank was so interesting to watch him do things. And that if it wasn't something he could eat, he stopped trying to bite that thing. And I just think, and I know it's crazy, but I think you, they, you get it shaken off fish. They know it's not a, it's not real anymore or whatever. And I, I don't think they, I still think you can catch one, but I think it, if you went in there and got 30 bites, it's, I don't think, I think some of those fish leave and then will never bite again, regardless of whether you hooked them or not. And there's nothing, I don't know how to, I don't know how to change that. You're muted again. You're muted. I don't know. Let's see. You're, you're, I'm not doing it. You're pounding on the desk over there, sending it into mute. Yeah. No, dude, I, I, 
I agree with you. I think the less you can show a bait to a fish, the better. But you, yes. in my opinion, have a much, much greater chance of catching that fish if you shook them off the first time. Than totally agree. Hook the fish. But I, it, you know, it's funny what you're saying. What, what your experience in your tank is the same thing that like the Berkeley guys will talk about. Like they've got tanks up at their uh, Spirit Lake facility. And they literally will, they call it the racetrack. They'll have a bass in there and they'll run baits by it. And the bass, like after the first bite, they'll almost always hold off. And it takes up to six months to get that same fish to bite that same bait again. Like they, 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 yeah, they, and there's no hooks on those. There's no hooks on it. Yeah. Like that's, I mean, there's definitely a, a I mean, that's how, that's how they, you know, right? Like we... You put something in front of me, I can pick it up and play with it and smell it. And, you know, before I put it in my mouth, a bass has got to put it in their mouth to determine if it's something that's uh, edible. So from that standpoint, that's basically like their hand. So you're going to love this. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I heard this the other day and it made me think, you know, how like now people say stuff that are like, like, oh, my gosh, that's really, really funny. Or I've never thought about this. Everyone, everyone listening to this is going to is going to think about this for like the next 10 seconds. <laughs> Even so, like you said, like you play with stuff with your hands and stuff. You got to like feel it. Do you know? Think about this. You have no idea. You've never put your tongue on a tree like bark, right? I mean, not not that I can recall. I have touched a cold light pole with okay, my tongue. But, Don't do but, that. But you've never put, you've never licked bark on a tree, but you, uh, but your, know. but your tongue knows what it would feel like. Yeah, and, I kind of feel like so, it. Yeah. Well, yeah. So everything, everything in the, out there, like that, you pretty much touch with your hands or something. Your tongue actually knows. Like you're like, yeah, my tongue would know what that would feel like. And it, and I started thinking about that. Like, yeah, I don't, I've never licked a tree, but I know exactly what it would. Be. And so I started. They, he and I was like. That's the weirdest thing that that it that, yeah your tongue's yeah. never done that but yet it would probably know what <laughs> almost every surface feels like just because of that and I, I don't know I just thought that was funny one time because I was like I don't know why someone would think about that but that's pretty funny but yeah, yeah now, that, I'm, now I'm thinking about licking everything in my room I know <laughs> it, but you uh, wouldn't have to because you'd already know yeah I, no I will I will say just to end that little that little rant there on pre fishing. Like with respect to those frogs, I think it's critical. Like if you go into an area and you get two or three bites, don't even, don't even shake it. Like don't even fish it. Like I, I'll leave it and go yeah. back hoping that I get 30 bites. But I do agree with you that the less interaction our baits can come in contact with those bass, the better off. I, I used to growing up thinking, man, it, it doesn't matter how many I shake off. I'm good. Cause I'm not setting the hook on them. And and like I said, I mean, and then yes, the other day at Conroe, when I, that one bit and I pushed the button and it's taken off, you know, and it's just peeling line, no big, like whatever. And she jumps and I'm like, what, it, what are you doing? And I'm like, God, it's a big one. Cause a lot of them were small and I'm like, gosh, dang it. And I'm like, I kind of just slowly reeled this fish in going, how am I really, why? And I get it in and it swallowed it so deep the that it was wedged in between her gill. And I was, and it, it was a soft plastic. And I was going, what in the world? And I was like, and then I made like two more casts or something, got bit. And I called up Russell. I said, I'm done practicing. I don't know what else, but I'm not going to show these fish. He's like, yeah, get out of there. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm done. Because it was, it was one of those deals where at times I would throw here, get a bite, throw here, and then throw there and get three bites on three casts, nowhere near each. And I'm like, what? what am I doing here? Like, I don't know what's better. We're just going to have to figure it out. Yeah. And, and like I said, I mean, what, how long does it take for a fish to res uh, reset after it spits a bait with it? I mean, I think they'll bite again. I think they'll bite again the same day, but I also think that. So I have this really big belief and, and for right now I'm staying with it and I don't care what anyone says. Um, <laughs> And if anyone watches my fantasy picks, why picking live scope picks only. And I keep joking about like, they're never going to be on the bank again. 
obviously that's not with every lake, but I do believe that um, I think they're not on the bank as much because I I feel I think that j- just like deer or bat or anything like you get deer hit you know get a bunch of deer getting hit on the freaking side of the highway deer are gonna stay away from the side of the highway more right I think bass getting caught in general I think for years that I think they kind of know that the closer they get to the bank the more they get caught and the further they get away I think the further they are away from boats like a fish out there in the middle of the lake in 50 foot of water out in a bunch of stumps doesn't see a boat but it gets up shallow regardless of whether it eats your bait it sees boats every day just about you know what i'm saying and i just think that they've we're catching so many more of them now out there with live scope <laughs> i'm not saying the weights have gotten better but there's no doubt people that more people are catching fish and i just think they're starting to like get a I think the pressure is moving them away from the bank, regardless of whether they even get on the bank. I think what has happened is that they they got no pressure out there for years. And then they're like, go up to the bank or whatever, and they might get caught, you know, might get caught and they go back out there. Now they're like, I don't even want to go up there anymore because they're getting caught out there now before they even get up there. I, I there's, it is happening to every lake I know. And, and I just, I don't know how every lake I know the bank is getting worse. It has not gotten better. And everyone keeps on, and I was, hey, listen, I was wrong. I kept on saying like, like hey, man, um, it's going to leave more fish on the bank for me because no one's fishing the bank anymore. And I'm like, there's a reason no one's fishing the bank anymore because I fish it and sometimes I can't catch anything. Like I can't even hardly get a bite sometimes. I'm not saying every lake. I'm just saying lakes like Toledo, there was no reason for them not to be up there shallow. Yeah, dude. The the, the, right that the whole, way, they're all getting like that. The the con the concept of you know let everyone scope them offshore will eventually make the bank better. That's not going to happen. I mean, I I think if anything, what we're realizing is the majority of the bass population lives offshore, and from that standpoint, they occasionally will swing in to do their things up on the bank, whether that's the spawn or they pull in to feed. I mean, I think like you mentioned it earlier, you know, even shallow fish generally, when you, when you get a bite and they go, they go deeper, like they're going to go eat that and go sit out 20 feet, you know, over 20 feet of water. So to me, I feel like the bank has always been a feeding location for them and they come in, they feed and they leave. And at that point they spend the majority of their time offshore. And I, I mean, I think like I, I don't I don't fully understand, I guess, everything that's going on, but I do think similar to kind of what you were saying, the more the fish are caught offshore scoping them, I think the more that takes them out of their routine where they're not gonna pull in to eat at that point. So what? like I think I think they just stay offshore, they recover from being caught, and they're like, you know what, I'm not I'm not going to the bank. It like threw them out of their routine and yeah, I I just there's I don't I'll tell you this, dude. Like everyone is trying to make this case right now that the fish, oh, they know what's going on. They're they're they can hear the they they feel getting hit with the beam. They're swimming away from the boat, dude. You go out on Toledo Bend right now, or at least when I was there a couple of weeks away or well, weeks ago, they would different. swim. They were swimming right to the trolling oh, motor, dude. Okay, so let let me let me say all this. So because all these guys are saying all this, and and I'm just. This is all I'm going to say. Stop comparing fishing to what you think you knew about fishing because Drew Gill and all of us, we're all telling you, whatever we thought about fishing, we were wrong. For 50 years, we've been wrong this whole time. And Drew said it, and that's why I still say I like live scope. It's why I like it's why I like sight fishing more than any other type of fishing because I never made claims about sight fishing and fishing on the banks and why lakes weren't good. I didn't do it based on my ability to catch a fish. I based everything on my ability to look down in the water and see a fish. And so when I go to your lake in the middle of the spawn, right? And I've been to that lake a hundred times. And this year I see half as many fish and I'm like, they are not in here. Like, and they're like, yeah, the lake's fishing tough. They're just not biting. I'm like, nope, they're not in here. 
I I I would normally see 300 fish, and now I only see 100 fish, 150 fish today, and it's been like that every single day I go. Like they're not in here. I just make claims because I can visually see them, not because I get more bites, right? Because it, bites to me is irrelevant. Like I might fish good one day and fish horrible the next. It doesn't really matter. If you if I look at it as as other animals, deer. If you hunted deer and deer were getting shot at, right? Do you think they're going to go into more open areas or deeper and further into the woods? Deeper and further into the woods, they're going to go as as deep as they possibly can. The most protection a bass can probably get is out there in the deepest part of the lake, out in the middle of the lake. Like they're never going, like that's that's their protection. I don't think getting up there in three foot of water, not fish don't like to live in three foot of water. They don't. They they might prefer to be up there to like eat and stuff and do some things, but I don't think that that's where they feel the safest. Uh, they got too many, yeah. I mean, everything can get them there, right? Birds can get them there. People can get them there. Like, like, and like there's a reason they are that way. There's plenty of bait out there deep. They never really have to go up shallow to eat. We, we can see that now. So I just don't think, I, I know they think they're not thinking about fishermen. Deer only think about hunters when they get shot, but after they get shot, they're dead. That's the point is these well, think about it. These like squirrels will come up to you in your bone backyard and don't care about you opening the door and walking outside. But you go out in the woods and step on a stick and a squirrel's yeah. freaking going like he knows there's a difference like they do know. And these fish aren't getting shot. They're getting caught putting their, you know, like I don't think I'm not saying they're getting hurt, but I mean, it's not normal for them to probably get caught, get handed, get a bait out of their mouth and put back in the water. They're like, man, I don't know if I really like that. And so we're, we're teaching them that. And then they're going back. If the difference between Toledo is Toledo's massive. So like live scope and all this stuff will never hurt places like Rayburn and Toledo because they're just massive. Like you can put a thousand boats on Rayburn. It will never hurt Rayburn. It's too big. Toledo's is, so you'll, you're getting fish at Toledo that don't care. Like they'll swim up to you, but how many fish were people catching at Toledo? A bunch. Yeah. Like, well, so, um, so here's a question for Toledo. My perception coming away from that tournament is the whole Demiki thing was not is not a well-known tactic there and the only reason i say that is i went to three gas stations slash bait shops trying oh, to yeah. find some stuff for it couldn't do it dude i had to drive all the way over to tackle addict like well so so, so does that to me that says that's not a, it was not a real popular technique i think it will be now but maybe uh, i'm it wrong won't, it won't be it won't be as much as you think um they can get mad at me all I want to do. I'm I'm a freaking redneck from Texas from down here. So I can talk about my own people. Um, <laughs> dude, you still got, there's still, you still got a bunch of country rednecks out there fishing, man. Throwing Like you go out there any time of the day, like, they're throwing wor lizards that you can't buy that were 20 years ago, catching 10 pounders on lizards, yeah. Texas rigging them. I mean, the Texas rig lizard is still a thing down there at Toledo and it will weigh in 10 pounders not in tournaments all day long. So they don't have to go do all that other stuff. And they're not going to, um, you get on some of these lakes and you can't hardly catch a fish without doing that technique. Toledo's not one of them. And Rayburn's not one of them. I mean, those other techniques catch fish and they're catching fish as normal as as it probably has always been. Some of those guys are like, man, I had six bites today or I had four bites. You know, they're just going out there getting bit. Now, in a tournament setting, you talk to that guy and then you're like, hey, did you catch one day? I'm like, yeah, I had like, call like 65. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, I had a couple six pounders and a 10 and whatever. And they're like, I'm like, yeah, but I'm doing this other. Well, they're not going to go do that. They're just going to keep throwing their Texas rig lizard around that they've been throwing around forever. So it's just one of those deals that you can still, it's such a big lake and it's such a good lake. You can catch fish doing whatever, but yeah, guys aren't going to go out there and do that. That doesn't, they, they don't have to, they don't need to. 
and the tournament guys that roll around there, we, we don't really care about trying to go get it. Dem- we're, we're bringing Dominique Riggs there, you know? <laughs> I will say, to go back to you mentioned, you made a comment earlier about like how, you know, we everything we've known for 50 years is wrong. I don't, I like, I, I totally kind of agree with the statement, but I don't think it's a fair statement. I'm not saying you, I've heard this from a hundred people, like, you know, that you can throw out the window, everything we knew. I think the difference is that book was written without forward facing sonar. So that book was written to give the, when I say book, right. The, the idea that we should be fishing channel swing banks and things like that, that's all based on not having the knowledge of forward facing sonar and it was based on hey these are high percentage areas to fish for those fish that are bank related but that really what we're finding is now that's turning out to be like 10 percent of the population well and the what i get let me define this about what i think we were wrong about because we had this conversation sunday me and russell on the boat because we still because we don't know i always laugh so like and i don't know about everyone else but it always bothered me when i went up and threw on a point this happened all the time on raven there's a big old giant point and i'll go up there and i throw on that point and i drag my worm across and i get a bite and i catch that fish and i'm like you know first cast heck yeah it's a big one and i throw back out there and nothing and then i throw and i throw and i throw and i have to I have to make like 12 casts to cover the entire point. I never get another bite. I was like, how do I get that lucky to throw where that fish was? Because if you've read any magazines, it's not anyone's fault, but if you read magazines, if you read anything, what does it show? It shows, it's always shows a stump or a tree or a rock pot. It always shows these things. And it shows a fish. And what is that fish doing? It's sitting there. It's sitting there waiting. It's just that's that's what they do, right? Fish just sit there and wait. And then I get on, then we get live scope, and I'm like, gosh dang, about one percent of the fish sit. All the rest of them swim around constantly. And you're like, which sounds stupid, right? That you mean like fish just swim around? To me, fish weren't that big, they weren't really swimming around all the time. They were. They would swim to places, but then they would they would like kind of stay in that area. Well, now I'm like, wait a minute, like crappie. It's amazing to watch crappie swim constantly back and forth between brush piles. Mm-hmm. Like, like if you have three brush piles and they get to like catch two or three and they swim to that brush pile, and then like three minutes later they swim to that brush pile. Well, we never knew that was going on. So when guys are catching them underneath the boat, crappie fishing, and you catch them, and then and then like. They say like one after another and then nothing. And they're like, oh, they stopped biting. No one ever in their right mind said they swam 20 feet away. They quit biting. And then all of a sudden we start catching them again. Oh, they started biting again. No, they didn't. Dude, they're they going like this them. the whole time. <laughs> but we never knew that. So on Conroe, we're power pulled down like everyone because there's 20 boats in the area. We can all talk to everyone. And everyone's power pulled down and you just got, you know, and we're all like fan casting around. And eventually you catch a couple, right? And I said, Russell, since live scope won't work, we're too shallow. You can't, no one can see anything. I'm like, are these fish, are these fish coming to us, swimming through us? Or are they, are they find like biting? Well, the funny thing was, is we caught a couple and doing that. And then, and then like, Guys would like make 50 casts and then finally catch another one. But then on one of these places, I we caught a couple and I picked up the old hybrid hunter because I was like, man, I can make I can only make this cast right here because if not, I'm gonna get hung up. And I made the cast and I catch a big one. I can well, I, I catch one, two casts later, I catch another big one. I've been throwing there like 20 times with other baits. So then I'm like, well, did it just not want to bite that other bait? You know what I'm saying? So like we're still yeah. Once again, it. I'm not going to tell you I knew exactly what was going on because the only information I have is whether I caught one or not. I can't see what they're actually doing. I can't see if fish are moving into me or if there are some fish that are just not wanting to bite your bait and they finally turn on. I don't know. But that's what we were. That's what we had all those years is we just had what we thought was going on. 
And that's still the case sometimes. We still don't know. Like, LiveScope doesn't show us everything. Dealing with living creatures, dude. They do whatever they want. Yeah. I mean, like, I like this is what I think was going on. Like, I always laughed at at those professional when the tournament was going on and they told you what was going on, and I just like instantly you find out that that was not the case. Like, they were all wrong. Dude, that that's all just a function of the angler trying to provide themselves with additional confidence, right? Like. They catch a fish and they're like, oh, I'm doing this. The fish are doing this and this. And it that's really, in my opinion, them building up their own in their own head to give themselves more confidence to keep doing it, which is a critical part to professional tournament fishing, to be confident in what you're doing. But half the time you hear somebody rattle off, you know, what they're doing and what the fish are doing. And you're sitting there going, I caught them doing something completely different. And yeah. I think you're full of BS, but. Hey, if you're confident doing it, then go do it. And I think that's one thing about fishing. Generally, what we find is there's a lot of different ways to catch them. I mean, a lot of different depth zones. There's very rarely one specific way to catch a fish. I I, I will say that I was one, always wondering when it, when people do use live scope and you and you have to like entice a fish to bite. Right. I mean, you have to like be like you have to be perfect. Like you can be three feet off and he's not going to come. Or if you go underneath them or do all these different things. And then we're up there shallow and we're just blind casting around like like how we were, like everyone was like we we're all just like throwing in circle. You know, we're all doing all this stuff going and, and like you have to like you have to go back to the old school because if it gets in your head of going. I could be thrown by one, you know, what? like I could be thrown by one. And if I'm not doing this right, I've seen how off you can be right. Like in the level, the level of yeah. the water or by three foot here and there. And I was like, man, cause sometimes when you're live scoping, you're like, how would you even catch a cat? How would you even catch a fish without live scoping? Sometimes when you like, you know what I'm saying? Like you, how perfect you have to be at times. And it's, a, you're like, this would, because co-anglers feel this Co every co-angler that's been out there in the water with some people <laughs> will be like yeah dude i'm just i'm just it's a it's a hope and a prayer that i even get one to bite because you're out there yeah. trying to perfectly get one within a foot and i'm out here like in 20 foot of water hoping that i make some random cast and he's in the right level yeah and he still wants to bite and i mean it's crazy Are you gonna are you gonna watch the fork? Am I gonna watch the fork? The fork. You're gonna watch them on fork. Oh I mean, I'll probably I'll pay a little attention. I, I don't didn't you know, know what you got going on. Uh I want it what's it start? Thursday? Tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah, what? I'm uh taking a little family weekend trip, I guess, this weekend, but I'll, I mean, I always pay attention to it. My boys are big into fantasy fishing, so we set teams and they like to keep track of it. But, I, you know, the funny thing is Fork is a lake that does not interest me that much. And I only say that I, I would love to fish it, but from like a tournament standpoint, like outside of bass, nobody ever goes there. So it's not one that I feel like there's a great chance of me going to fish. So I, I just have never paid as much attention to it. I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, like I, it, live, I live two hours from it and I could care less about it. Yeah. I mean, cause I mean, there's not local tournaments on it. Are there? No. Well, they're all there. That's why we don't go it's fish. The slot it's limit. It's a slot yeah. and it's so the slot's so small. It's a less than 16 inch and a 24 incher. So it's basically yeah. a 10, go catch a 10 or some under. Now we have a tournament on that lake. Uh, is it the, Texas, we're going there for the first. I'm having a tournament there for the first time ever this mm -hmm. year. Now it's going to be at the time of the year that we're going to be quite all right. We're going to go get to do what we want to go do. But yeah. I mean, it, um, yeah, I mean, it, you're going to go out there and like say, say they are on beds. We're going to be going by going eight pounder, eight pounder, seven pounder, six pounder, eight pounder, and just mm -hmm. like, yeah, those won't help. Yeah. 
And then, and yeah. then we're going to see a 15 and three quarter going, Ooh, is that going to be under? Like we're going to be excited <laughs> for a fifth, you know, it, that's I'm actually fish. I'm actually more excited to see how uh West point goes down for the invitational yeah. series. Like that, that interests me more than fork for some reason. Have you talked to anyone? Uh, very briefly. And it sounded like it was tough. That's, that's it. It was the guy I talked to usually will talk to me a little bit longer and was not very in the mood to yeah. talk. Was not happy. <laughs> that's exactly how my conversation went down. I was like, how's it going? No, it's muddy. Yeah. It's bad. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, I guess I'll let you get back to get back to it. And they're like, yeah. Yep, yep. They didn't That's want to talk a, about it, but I swear you called the same person I did because I know yeah. he did, but it was yeah, it was I was like, all right, I'll I'll let you go. I I, I, I got I, it. I wanted to call him the off day, but I forgot tomorrow's the off day, not today. Yeah. I mean, dude, I, I will say, like at this point, there's so much live coverage, it's hot like I almost feel like I pick and choose more than in the past. Like I remember when I was working a corporate job and it was like, I mean, I, I was like live is on, right? Like it was this cool ordeal and it was the only, there was only one circuit to watch. And now there's so much of it that it's like, well, if I, if I don't watch fork, I'll watch this or watch that. Or, you know, it's like, there's basically live coverage every day. And, you know, I feel like that's a, a big part of the sport from a, not that it's negative because I think it's important, but I, I do feel like it it's hurting the circuits as well because the views are being so split. I mean, yeah. you know, we were at Sandy Cooper and at the same time the bass was at the Toledo Bend. And it's like there's they're just there's so much footage now. People are the views are just being split up. Well, and and I had a I had a long talk uh the other day with some people and and of course, I didn't watch any of this. So the only bit, the only bit I watched was Friday. I turned the Bassmasters or whatever was it open something. I turned something on. I guess it was the. I don't even remember, but it was Friday. I or I turned it on Friday because I was on practicing on Conroe, and I had it on, and it was quiet. I, you know, it was like with one blowing, so I could I could hear for like an hour. But I told people, I'm like, man, our sport's so weird too because. There was a uh, 150 got 150 boats on Conroe Saturday and Sunday, so 300 anglers. Just on little old Conroe, right? Just just let's just pick one little lake in the country, and there was 300 guys that like diehard fishermen, and they didn't watch anything of the elites. But the elites yeah. this past weekend, yeah, or, huh? Yeah. So it was yeah, and then it was y'all, yep. and we didn't watch any of it. It, not because we didn't want to, but because we're fishing a tournament. And I was like, think about that. Think about across the country, how many guys were fishing tournaments Saturday and Sunday that didn't watch any of y'all, like yeah. hundreds of thousands of people were fishing. And I was like, that's always been a problem because I've always said during Sunday, there's not a whole bunch of flag football guys out there playing flag football, not watching the NFL Sunday, you know, and that's, I don't, I'm not, I don't know all the answers to everything. I'm just saying that's a, I'm not even saying it's a problem. I'm just saying that's a, that's a fact that we have a lot of our fan base, you know, like no one, if UFC is having a, a, a fight night, you know, there's not like something, it's not like there's a couple hundred, th- Street hundred fights going there. on everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, all freaking getting around cages and fighting this too. But I was like, the one time they have tournaments is the one time, most of the tournament fishermen are also doing the same thing. Yeah. It's kind of a weird, it's a weird thing. No, that's, that's not normal in any other sport. Yeah, it, it is weird. The, the other thing with respect to the live footage right now that I I'm, I'll be very curious to see is, you know, not only do our numbers increasing, but is the average view time decreasing? Cause it, it sounded to. like it, yeah, it sounded like, like we got some kind of bare numbers from, uh, major league fishing for our first tournament in Toledo bend. And they, you know, basically they said that the views were up really good from the first tournament last year, which again, I, I don't even know if that's a good comparison. Cause I do think that you got to look at things like you were just saying, like 
you know, what what was the weather like that day, the previous year for most of the country? Because if it was raining and most people stayed home, views are probably going to be higher. So I don't even know how you compare that. But they did state that the views were up, you know, significantly. But the av- the total number of hours watched or the average view time per or minute per view was kind of stagnant like it didn't go up which means people are more people tuned in but they tuned out quite a bit faster and they they attributed that to forward facing sonar so and i I talked to luke the other day and i talked to ronnie moore a couple days ago too um they they do have numbers right so i know there's there's numbers to all this stuff my only thing about numbers is is like and they might be like maybe our sport grows every year anyways right i mean so it's kind of hard to say that it's not it's like inflation grows every year right i mean it it is what it is i I don't know if you can compare the two i i do believe that having it on toledo and nothing against toledo but i mean or nothing toledo showed out it showed out for both of y'all's events, right? Uh, Rayburn showed out for the Invitationals. Uh, Fork is going to show out. Sandy Cooper showed out. West Point is not going to show out. Mm-hmm. It's not going to. So, um, Washita, Okeechobee showed out. Washita, I think, was was um, it, probably interesting for some people because it was – it, it wasn't dominated by forward-facing sonar like I think everyone thought. I will say that I I, I believe you can't. There's people on these comments. So all these people in these comments, I will never disregard every, everyone that has made comments on here. I, I won't sit there and disregard what they say except a couple of them. There's only a couple of them that I don't pay any attention to. And you can tell real quick who they are, right? They're just, they're kind of being jerks. You know, they're they're causing a scene, whatever. Everyone else Upshaw. on there, huh? Upshaw's on there just ripping into you. Yeah, Upshaw. Like no one cares about Upshaw. Like I, I should, I should ban him real quick. Just put a little, <laughs> put a user in timeout. Um, I, I think, I think that all these people actually care about fishing. There's about one percent of them that like. If someone gets on here and is like, live scope's cheating. Live scope should be banned. Live scope, and, and all they do is just regurgitate whatever they've ever like they could say hey look man i like fishing and everything live scope's not my favorite it's kind of hard for me to watch and i really don't you know bubble all this stuff you can't sit there and say that that guy's a hater no he just doesn't like it and, and his opinion is totally fine like i i have zero problem with that guy's opinion because he's he's stating something very eloquently that he's like hey man i just i don't like it and it's hard for me to watch. And he's not saying they should ban it. He's just like, man, I'm probably just going to turn turn off and go, which most of us do, right? If some most of us on social media, if we don't like something, we don't sit there and put a thumbs down and tell them we hate you. We just move on. But <laughs> those guys that move on, those guys should be like accounted for. And so, I mean, I do think that those guys are. Um, you should take those guys into account. And there's a bunch of people telling you very as nice as they can that they don't like watching live scope. Yeah. It, and it, I, well, mean, and I, I don't know that it's even that they don't want to watch people live scoping. Like this was something Drew Gill mentioned. He goes, I think it's more a function of people don't like to watch people use spinning gear. And I was like, I could kind of see that. I think it has more to do with the fact that the on some of these lakes especially early on it's such a dominating tactic that all 10 guys with cameras are doing the exact same thing and therefore it's more a function of well i see what's going on i don't really need to watch anymore because i'm not going to get to see a guy you know spill some tips on crankbaits or spinnerbaits or whatever and it's just a matter of you know, I, I don't I don't know that it's they hate watching it. I think it's they're just once you've seen one guy doing it, everyone is doing the same thing. Well, I think that's I I've said that before too. 
that watching 10 guys, when I call it like oversized crappie fishing, is not is not enjoyable to watch. I do like when you have, I think Washita, the open showed like multiple people doing different things. Um, I think Fork will show multiple, I think it'll show guys doing different things. So I think Fork will be different. I think that's just, I think that's what happens with smallmouth. When you go up there and catch smallmouth and you see every single guy with the spinner rod catching the same size fish, like, oh, it's yeah. a four and a quarter. As a four, it looks, it looks just like the other 30 fish I, I saw get caught on the same bait. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that like, but you watch a guy. I, I mean, I can go back to certain videos. You watch, you watch Chris Lane go down the bank with a whopper plopper. Like when no one even, and he's just got curse. I mean, they're just blowing up. I mean, like I remember, I'll never look back and go, Hey, you remember when they were throwing that little oversized crappie jig catching six pounders? Yeah. No, but I remember Chris Lane with that whopper plopper, just like them blowing up on it. And, and then you can go like, Hey, you remember that when they were catching them on a frog and it was like blow up after blow up. And he's like, Cru you know, I remember those fish catches. I, I think that's where, and it, it could be like deep cranking. I mean, think about Kentucky Lake when they had Kentucky Lake and you had guys throwing oversized swim baits. You had guys cranking. You had guys throwing. You had a guy like a Brett Height that was like throwing something really, really like a – what was he doing? He was a uh, basically – almost Yeah, in like 20-something foot of water. Just him doing it was freaking awesome. Yeah. Like because you're like – what is this guy doing? Like he's competing with all these guys throwing big crankbaits and everything. And he's like Nico rigging in 20 foot of water, but it was just one of those. It was just him doing it. So it was, it was really special to watch like all these different guys do all these techniques. Now it's like, Hey, throw this minnow on this jig head. It, and, and, and you can't complain about any of the fishermen because gosh dang, it's, yeah, look at him. He just weighed in 96 pounds in four days. Or whatever. You know, I mean, I don't blame him, but when they is, get on the when they get fork, shallow, it's gonna help. I was gonna say, is fork gonna be straight scoping, or do you think the bank's gonna play? I well, even if it plays, can it can it compete? That so well, that, that's what I that's what I mean. Like, can't I'm I mean, no, everything can play, no, but I'm saying, is no, it going to be the standing timber, no, no, same yes. old scoping? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, when I when you, I was saying no to, e I mean that's the thing. Like you you look at Toledo Bend, you look at the Bassmaster results, and it's like you look at the bottom of the field, and it's like, yep, those guys were beating the bank. Like you know you know who it was and they caught well, they the crazy thing is they still caught them pretty good like a lot of those guys had 14 15 a day and it's like they you just can't compete with that well so it, and andrew said it not like i get it but he, maybe i'm wrong i'm gonna throw this out there so like i don't mind throwing things out there and everyone can tell me i'm wrong um they have not been on the beds and i think they're they tried to over the last four or five days uh, it's going to be 43 tonight here. Fork is always way later than all of our lakes, and our lakes are not really there. Are there fish on beds? Yes. Would I go out there hoping I could go? Could you maybe in a one-day event, one day, right now, today, go hammer on them? Yes, maybe today. The problem is the they haven't had the cold weather. It's cold now. But it's going to get down to the 40s tonight. And then they're going to um, – and then it's going to be a high of 55 tomorrow. going to get in the 40s again. And this front's coming through. So, yeah, you, you could get them – you could catch them right now on a bed because they said, oh, there's fish on beds. It was 80 for the last four days. It's yeah. not about to be 80 again. And they probably just got there. And I always know when I sight fish, this is the one time of the year I don't like – I'm like, man, we can do it but we're probably not going to try to win because we're fishing for like 3% of them that got up there while the other 97% are like right out there. Yeah. And I think that's the problem is that, yeah, there's some up there, but man, 
over a multi-day event unless they're unless you can consistently have new ones moving. I don't think they're going to be moving up anymore because it's going to get cold. So they might catch them day one. They caught them on day one at Toledo. Some guys sight fishing. They I believe not, they did not catch them after day one. They caught everything that was up there, and then it was over with. Yeah, I think that was is what's going to happen at at Fork if they're even there. We will see. Andrew, listen, man. Andrew's over there trying to like be all smart and throw in good things. And go do something. What's it? Andrew's got other stuff to go do. Go do the, something. Those, the guys that are out scoping aren't supplementing any fish. Those they, aren't. Yeah, they don't. They don't need to be hitting the bank. But I think he's just talking about like other guys that are fishing and like. Because I will say if it. Well, I don't know if they're scoping today. They might be having to look today because it would be hard to scope today. With like it's with the wind. Hot. Oh my gosh! Uh, it might be easier day. to scope than to look in some places. Yeah, but at least you can get protected by some banks and stuff and kind of go mm -hmm. look. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, it's it's almost when it blows this hard, it's hard to go out there and scope anywhere. You know. At least on the bank, you can get right up on the bank and maybe get some clean, clear water, but I don't know. All right, dude. Well, I got a 2 o'clock that I got to jump on, so I got to get off on this one. All right. It was good talking to you. I will uh, we'll holler. We got some more free time. Maybe we'll let Andrew come in. Yeah, man. Sounds good. I appreciate you having me on. All right, man. All right. See you. See you.